Welcome back, everybody. Clearwater Jazz Holidays, Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. This is Steve Weinberger, CEO of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation. We are here with Jeff Rupert back again for his next topic, improvisation from the ground up. Jeff, welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm great, and it's great to be here and uh, with the Clearwater Jazz Holiday. Always a pleasure, Steve. Thank you so much, Jeff. Everybody's muted that's participating today for the courtesy of the session. But if you have questions, use the chat feature. We'll get those to Jeff. And your feedback is always appreciated. If you have that, send it over to info at clearwaterjazz.com. Check out all these awesome resources online. Our education and outreach page is the, is the best start. You'll see all the upcoming sessions. And then we have this wonderful studio resource of recorded archived material. And we have a new podcast. So if you like to listen, that's what you do. Go to the podcast, check out all these sessions, all these amazing musicians and educators that are participating. Like Mr. Rupert, let me tell you something about Jeff, and I'm going to turn it over to him. He is a saxophonist, composer, record producer, recording artist. He's a trustee chair, Pegasus professor, and director of jazz studies at the University of Central Florida. He's been featured soloist on dozens of recordings with artists including Sam Rivers, Mel Torme, Diane Shore, Benny Carter, and Maynard Ferguson, including Grammy award-winning albums. He has several releases under his own name, including Let's Sail Away with Veronica Swift, and Imagination and R&D with pianist Richard Drexler. He is currently the leader of the Jazz Professors, a sextet which had top Jazz Week charting hit albums in 2012 to 2015. He joined Sam Rivers' band in 1996 and appeared in four recordings with the group. He has performed at hundreds of concerts with Sam Rivers, including performances at Lincoln Center, the Vision Festival, New York City, and Columbia University. He has been a member of the Jaguar International Jazz Series. He's played at jazz festivals around the world with dates in Europe, Scandinavia, Japan, Taiwan, Israel, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. He was just talking to me about some new projects that he has coming up, which sound very exciting. We're really, we're really looking forward to hearing and seeing more. And as a music educator, he is a frequent clinician for festivals, college, high school, and middle school music performance assessment <laughs> and music education clinics for music educators at events like the Florida Music Educators Association Annual Conference in Tampa, Florida. And he has been a, a regular participant in our Young Lions Jazz Master Sessions um, since 2016, really. And here he is for his second virtual session. Jeff, welcome back. It's such a pleasure to have you again. The stage is all yours. Thanks, Steve. It's always a pleasure to be working with the Clearwater Jazz Holiday. And I see my friend Lee. Great to see you, Lee. Appreciate the help and uh, happy to be here. It's amazing to me. Wherever I go in the world, people always love jazz music. And uh, it's just, uh, there's just so many jazz fans out there. And I think jazz fans are the ones that are so hip and they all fly below the radar. And it's like a lot of people keep quiet until uh, they get around their people. And jazz people are that way. I remember um, I was playing, I used to play in Thelonious Monk Jr.'s band. And I remember we were playing in uh, the South Orange, New Jersey Community Center. You know, you figure, wow, what's going to be happening there? And it was packed. And I remember meeting um, meeting people who were, uh, uh, one was a, a videographer for PBS making specials. And I learned about some of my favorite books I've read since then through jazz fans. So the reason I bring that up is I always end up learning as much from uh, anybody that I'm sure anybody learns from me because jazz just always attracts such a hip, hip crowd. So thank you uh, folks for being here today. But I'm going to talk about improvisation today from the ground up. Improvisation, of course, is what is central to jazz music. Prior to Louis Armstrong, um, 
there was a little jazz being played. Um, Buddy Bolden was really the first jazz musician, and he, and this is New Orleans, of course, uh, the early 19, uh, early 20th century. But it wasn't until Louis Armstrong came along that everyone said, now that's really what jazz is about. And, and Louis Armstrong codified jazz improvisation and really kind of uh, codified the jazz vocabulary from the onset. It's really, it's really astounding. So one of the, um, one of the things that's really important about jazz music is it's improvisation based. And, and the thing is, the improvisation isn't, um, isn't just about one person improvising, it's about a collective improvisation. Um, you know, great improvisation is not exclusive to jazz music. Uh, classical musicians, Beethoven, Mozart, they're great uh, improvisers. We know that. Bach, Bach was an amazing improviser. He could improvise a fugue. What is really interesting about jazz music is it's this collective improvisation. And if we look at it in a communal artistic perspective, we really understand that it's a, uh, it's the use of a language. It's the creation of a language and the use of a language. So one of the attractive things about jazz music is to be an improviser and say, hey, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in this jazz band and I'm going to be improvising. But the reality is you're just not going to play anything. It doesn't mean you are free to play anything at all. And let me, let me give the analogy. It's just like talking. Um, uh, as I'm speaking now, I'm free to say whatever I want. And, uh, but there's ramifications. One of the things, if I don't use a vocabulary, no one's going to be able to understand me at all. You have to use a vocabulary that other people understand. So as a jazz musician, there's a responsibility to know that vocabulary. Where does that vocabulary come from? Well, it obviously comes from the past. Uh, comes from um, musicians that precede us, recordings that precede us. So when I talk about learning improvisation from the ground up, the first thing that we do is we check out recordings of the masters. Um, we can go all the way back to Louis Armstrong, um, but there's even more current recordings, relatively speaking, that are really important. One of the first forms we want to look at is the blues. Uh, blues form is uh, really kind of one of the central form, forms in jazz. And understanding that vocabulary and then standing on the shoulders of greatness and developing our own vocabulary based on that vocabulary is really what's important. And this is nothing new for us now. Uh, if you listen to Miles Davis, Miles Davis was a huge uh, fan of Dizzy Gillespie's. And also, he was a huge fan of Charlie Christian's. And this is really important because Charlie Christian did not play the trumpet. Charlie Christian played the guitar. But Miles said, man, he was really the first guy he heard that was really improvising at a deep level on music, not just the A sections and tunes, but the bridges, everything. So that's a window into learning right there. Like, hey, you don't need to be you don't need to only study trumpet players if you're trying to get good at improvisation and you play trumpet. You go to whoever's playing the best stuff. That's what you do. And that's what that's what Miles did. Um, one of the saxophonists um, that is great for uh, players to study, especially from the ground up, is Hank Mobley. Hank was originally from Philadelphia. Well, he's coming out of the style of Gene Ammons, who came right before him, and then most off of Lester Young. A uh, great trombone player that is great to check out is um, uh, Curtis Fuller, who's from Detroit. And these guys, their vocabulary is very simple, but yet very hip. We have to remember that improvising and being a musician is like being an artist. The goal, if, you're, if, we, if you and I went to an art gallery, the goal is not to use as much paint as possible. The goal can be varied, of course you know, uh, from artist to artist, but it's not a sport. You know, when you go to a basketball game, the team that scores the most points wins. In jazz music or art, the person that uses the most paint or the musician that plays the most note does not win. It's not the way it works. And that's something we need to keep in mind that music, while you have to learn an instrument, uh, and that's a very serious endeavor, is still an art form. And ultimately what you're trying to do is convey 
your inner feelings. Uh, as a jazz musician, we're very in a very re- unique setting. As a, in classical music, you could be having a great day, and if you play in the Chicago Symphony, and you're going to go play some Mahler, well, you might be playing some very depressing music. I mean, not all Mahler is depressing. That's not my intention of that statement. My intention is that you cannot control the, mu- the music if you're playing classical music. If you play in a great rock band, if you're, you know, Steve Lukather or whoever in Toto, and you're going to go play uh, Rosanna, you might not care about Rosanna. You might, you know, man, Rosanna was about a girl who, uh, you know, that uh, came and went. But now you might be married or, hap- you know, happily single, whatever. My point is that if you're playing rock music or you're playing classical music, your, your personal feelings at the point when you play a piece have nothing to do with the music. It's about delivering the music. As a jazz musician, what's so hip about it is you're bringing yourself to the table. So when I play uh, some blues, well, I can play some blues and be happy or sad because the blues is not just sad. The blues is a cathartic, can be a cathartic experience. And uh, a good example of that is if anyone's a fan of Billie Holiday or a fan of Ella Fitzgerald. They both sing the blues in varying ways. When Billie Holiday sings fine and mellow, she's pretty hip, she's slick, she's not sad. Um, So it's not always about being sad when you're playing the blues. And um, uh, like psychologists will say, uh, to, to move forward, a lot of times you need to have a cathartic experience and actually go through something. So the blues is a vehicle to go through the blues itself. Very profound, very hip but also very guttural and very simple at the same time. Are we making sense? Are we okay, Lee? <laughs> Is that cool? Yeah. So, you know, the playing the blues, listening to the blues are, um, you know, they're multifaceted. So that's a great vehicle to check out some music, but also ultimately what we're going to do as jazz musicians is create this vocabulary, but then express ourselves. And that's not too crazy. If you think about it, How did you learn how to speak? Any of you? Did you guys go to English class when you were six months old? I don't think so. I don't think so. You heard your brothers and sisters, your moms and dads, your your guardians, whoever. uh, You heard heard people talking on the radio, on television. You absorb this information. And then you start to put words together. I remember I have a a seven-year-old and a 14-year-old. I remember very well when they were little, They would say things in different ways. You know, my oldest son, when he started talking, he would just say words like blue, you know, or dad, or mom. Not sentences, just things. Trying to express himself and also say things that he heard. My youngest son, totally different. He didn't talk until, I think he was like two. And we started to worry, and the doctor said, don't worry, he's fine. One day, he just said, no, this is his first words. He goes, look, a blue tractor. And we're like, wow. He waited until he put a whole sentence together to ever utter a word. But that's him. He's that kind of guy. My older son, he's just going to try this, try that. That's the same way we learn how to improvise. We don't make up our own vocabulary. If you make up your own vocabulary when you were a kid talking, no one would ever understand you. And the purposes of vocabulary, the purpose of vocabulary is to communicate with one another. So when we use the term jazz vocabulary, we really mean that in the deepest sense of the definition of what vocabulary is about. So with that being said, I'm going to show you some scales and things. We'll, we'll get to that. And I'll post that so you guys have that as a resource. But if I just show you some scales, that's really not going to tell you anything about how to communicate. That would be kind of like me going or anybody going to some children here, here's a dictionary, go learn all the words and then come back to me and we're going to have a hang and talk. It doesn't work that way. Does it? We start talking to one another. Um, If any of you took a foreign language in high school or maybe middle school or college, what happens that first day of class, you walk in and the teacher is speaking the language. And you're like, what am I doing here? I have no idea what they're saying. And they just keep going. And all of a sudden, you start picking up a word here or there. 
and that's how it grows. You know, if I play. <laughs> I just played some blues. I don't, and I probably don't even need to tell you. This is bluesy. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you could relate to that. But everything I played is nothing, nothing that I invented. But yet it was it was me. And here's what I mean. When I'm using the words I'm I'm using right now, no one's copyrighted those words. You can't copyright words like that and lay ownership to it. I'm using words and putting them together to make my own sentence, my own expression. And not only am I using the notes, but it's how I'm using the notes. I can play the same notes a million different ways. That's one way. A little bit different feeling, right? Another way to play it. So not only are the notes important or the, the licks or whatever you want to call them important, but the way you play it's important. I said this before, but you know, um, a, lot of ver a lot of communication is nonverbal. If you and I are talking and you know me really well and you say, hey, Jeff, how you doing? I can say the word fine a bunch of different ways and you can take it a different, different way. I can say, hey, Jeff, how you doing? I go, fine. You say, hey, Jeff, how you doing? Fine. Yeah, it doesn't sound like I was fine, did it? Suddenly I was just kind of going through the motions. That's the way jazz improvisation is. Let me stop talking and let's listen to a master improviser, someone that we can all, I think, wrap our brains around. This is someone many of you probably haven't heard of. It's um, Curtis Fuller. I mentioned him a minute ago. This is his blues improvisation on a song called Hugor. I'm going to have to skip around to get to his solo, but let's listen to his solo. Hang on. This is Hugor. I'm going to share the screen. Here it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the melody play, what we call in jazz the head. I'm going to let it play those It's two choruses of that. Then I'm going to skip Hank Mobley's solo, the tenor player, and go to Curtis Fuller's solo. Hang on. Here we go. Okay, so even right there, the melody. Man, I can use that. That's vocabulary. That's already mine. And what did I learn from by picking it up off the recording? Now, imagine that was written out and I had to read it. I would go. That's not that's not really the whole picture, was it? Listen, listen to the way they played it. Listen to it. That has a little bit more vim and vigor, a little bit more verve than um, just reading it off the page. When I listen to them play it, it's kind of like me learning an accent, right? Like. Um, you know, there's a Boston accent, a Philly accent, a New York accent, a Southern accent, and within that, a bunch of different accents. So the way someone phrases something is very important. I think they played it. There's a whole bunch of information in the way I just played it that, that 
it would be hard to write down the way I articulated things. I kind of bent one note. Believe me, this stuff is super important. Just as important as any notes you might play. Let me move forward down to Curtis Fuller's solo. You're going to have to take my word for this. We might, if we have time, go back to the beginning. Hank Mobley plays about 10 beautiful choruses on his saxophone. He can play a lot of notes, too. Now, uh, Curtis Fuller is going to play, and he's not going to play a lot of notes. He's going to play a lot of heartfelt ideas. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a discussion with someone who has very few words to say, but you're almost hanging on every word they say? That's really, that's, that's um, very profound. And jazz improvisation is really that way. Sometimes when you play a lot of notes, it's kind of like talking a lot. Sometimes it can go in one ear and out the other. I know uh, some of the teachers I've had and some of the people that I'm really attracted to be around sometimes don't say a lot of words, but have, what they say seems to always hit home. That's the way this solo is. Let's check out a little bit of Curtis Fuller. Man, Curtis just goes on and on and on. If you notice, he's not playing really long, stretched out phrases, but they're really poised well. The space even plays in to the solo. It's just like talking. There was a, there was a guy that used to be on the radio when I was a kid. His name was Paul Harvey. And this guy used to talk and then leave this tremendous amount of space. And, I, you know, I was just kind of making an example like you do. And, and you, would, you would just be in the car listening to him, and you'd be on the edge of your seat. What's he going to say? Space is, is very important. Now, I acknowledge that you have to have something to play on either side of the space, but the space is very important. So here's how we learn how to improvise. You take a solo like this one, okay? You listen to it about 100 times. Really concentrate on listening, listening, listening over and over again. I see this, the success of all my students, the ones that are the most successful are the ones who spend a lot of time listening and listening critically, not listening while they're making dinner, 
or listening while they're doing something else, but really just listening and um, learning solos. So what you do is take, take this solo, maybe take a chorus, which is 12 bars. So let me see if I can sing that just to yourself. I know not everybody wants to be a singer, but in your car or maybe with your earbuds on, sing the chorus. When you feel like you can really sing a chorus, really sing it, you know, just to yourself. I'm not saying make a YouTube video and proclaim to the world, you know, some choruses of Curtis Fuller. But when you can play a chorus or sing a chorus, then say, let me learn it on my horn. Maybe, maybe you can't even learn that much at once. Maybe just go. Okay, let me do that again. In other words, I'm taking it just a couple notes at a time. But if you've listened to it five, six, or a hundred times, the, you're going to be able to play it on your instrument much quicker if you've listened to it a bunch before. Now, what am I learning when I'm learning those notes? Am I just learning the notes? No, I'm learning how to play the notes, how to inflect the notes, how to play the rhythm. Again, going back to speaking a language, you know, wherever you're from, you probably don't think you have an accent, but if you go somewhere else, Someone's going to think, man, this guy has an accent or this lady has an accent. Did you consciously learn an accent? I don't think so. I think you unconsciously developed an accent. I can tell, I think because I'm maybe, I think because I'm a musician, I'm sensitive to accents, to some anyway. Like I can tell when someone is from Philadelphia or maybe Baltimore. It's really kind of close too. Those cities aren't that far apart. Or I can definitely tell if someone's from North Jersey or South Jersey. And I can definitely tell if someone's from New York, generally if they're from the Bronx or Brooklyn. And I'm not unusual. There's, there's, I'm just sensitive about that because I grew up in those areas. And I'm sure all of you have, have um, the same experience. I'm always intrigued when I go to Boston or Cape Cod at how different these people speak there, even though we're all speaking the same language. So those inflections you pick up in language are the same inflections we want to pick up in solos like this Curtis Fuller solo. First thing you can do to learn jazz vocabulary is learn good solos. The other thing is to learn your instrument really well. How, if, you're, if you're trying to get good, make sure you have a really good private teacher. And Sometimes you might have a private teacher just to teach you your instrument. My instrument is obviously the saxophone. If you play trumpet, you might want to have a teacher who just teaches you trumpet. And you might study improvisation with someone else. It's not unusual. Um, I teach a lot of different uh, people how to improvise. I don't teach just saxophone players. I teach trombones, trumpets, guitar, bass, you name it. So when you're hunting out someone to study with, don't feel as though it has to be someone just on your instrument. You need to learn your instrument. Again, that might be with a certain teacher and your improvisation might be with another teacher. So the first thing is to really have an understanding of listening to some really important solos and then trying to emulate that. And what ends up happening is you start putting ideas together just like you're putting words together when you're speaking and they become your own. The worst thing you can do, in my opinion, is go buy a book of published solos written out. There's a book out that has all of Charlie Parker's solos in it. There's a book out of John Coltrane's solos. And I've had friends that try, try to learn the solos that way. It seems like the easy way out, like, oh, it's already written down, I can read it. It's actually 10 times harder. If you learn it by ear, you're already connected to the music. Think about it. This is deep. If you learn something with your eyes that is about an oral process, you're adding a step. You're adding a visual process to an oral process. If you learn it by ear, you're developing your ear and you're learning 
directly with your ear and your brain is connected from your ear to making the sound. We call that an oral, oral approach. You hear it and then you reproduce what you hear. The funny thing about that is you'll remember stuff a lot better too. If you write, if you write down solos or you read solos, you're missing all the nuance we talked about. Again, it's like, it's like saying, I'm gonna learn how to speak French. Let me pick up some uh, French literature. Well, you get somewhere with that, but if you go to France, you're going you're gonna to learn a heck of a lot more about the, uh, the French uh, language. Uh, same way with jazz. So I mentioned um, uh, there's another great solo on this. Hank Mobley's solo is great. Um, I've got a list. I'm going to, let me, in fact, let me do this now. I'm going to cut and paste and put into the Zoom meeting. Um, chat. Let me see if I can do this correctly. Here we go. Watch this. You can see this. Control D. There's a bunch of uh, URLs, and I'll send this to Steve Weinberger at the end of the day so Steve can post these in another format. These are YouTube videos of pieces that I think are really important to check out. The first three are blues. Here's Hugo, with it, which is um, Curtis Fuller. Soft Winds, which, which is Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, is Kenny Dorham on trumpet and Hank Mobley on tenor sax. Amazing blues choruses. Billy's Bounce, the one and only Stan Getz and J.J. Johnson. J.J. Johnson is from Indianapolis. Stan Getz is originally from Philadelphia. They play chorus after chorus of great blues. The song I Got Rhythm is, if anyone is uh, deeply into jazz, knows that uh, there's thousands of songs that are written based off those chord changes. That's why we call them now just rhythm changes. That, what that means is I've got the chord changes to I've Got Rhythm. Well, here's Sonny Stitt actually um, playing I've Got Rhythm. And here's Sonny Stitt with J.J. J. Johnson playing a song called Sunnyside. With, which is the chord changes to I Got Rhythm. And then he was famous saxophonist Don Bias playing I have Got Rhythm. Well, all these six solos here, they're attainable. If you did it in this order, even that I wrote it in, Hugo First, Soft Winds, Billy's Bounce, Sunny Side, I Got Rhythm, and this I Got Rhythm, you'd be golden. By the way, what I was going to tell you was when you start doing this, it's really good to start with something like Hugo because it's relatively simple, but your chops start to come together. You get better actually at learning solos. It's, it's a, so if you're not great at it at first and you have to go one note by one note and stop your computer, or your listening device, don't worry. Who cares? You know, when you go play a gig or you go play in your school, no one knows how much you practiced. There's no meter on your forehead that said, I practiced 20 hours. So if you come in and go, and some of your friends go like, man, what was that? You know, eh, some blues. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to lead on how long you spent working on something. You work on stuff because you love it, and you know that if you invest your time in it, the long-term gains are going to be there. That's, especially kids who are serious about jazz, they have a special place in my heart because they're not getting that instant gratification of, say, a video game or watching cartoons or something. They're, they're really investing in themselves. So this idea of listening, trying to learn solos, and recreating it is not to be underestimated. This is how all great players learned. There's a great video of the great piano player, um, Jimmy Rolls. Jimmy's bad. And um, they were talking about Lester Young, and he got really serious. He's like in his late 70s. And he goes, man, I learned how to play by memorizing Lester Young solos. And if I didn't do that, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, he's like, it's like he's really like he's going to have a, a, a seizure if you, if you took away the music of Lester Young. And uh, it's so beautiful. He's a piano player learning saxophone solos. He said that's how he learned how to play. Um, I remember I was on a record date with Benny Carter. Um, it was called Harlem Renaissance. And it was an all-star band. And Benny was really cool. 
he was 87 at the time and uh, sharp as a tack. And he would, what he would do is have a lot of older elder jazz statesmen, but then a lot of young guys too. So this band, there was like legends on it, like Frank West. Frank was sitting right next to me. He played in Count Basie's band. He played lead alto. It was the first band I saw when I was a kid. And I'm sitting next to Frank West. Next to me on the other side is Danny Banks, who played on the Birth of the Cool album with Miles Davis. I'm sorry, I'm Miles Plus 19. Played bass clarinet. And, you know, a bunch of legends in the band. At any rate, um, where am I going with this? Oh, I know what it was. I was kind of nervous because all these heavyweights were on the band. Well, as we were warming up, getting ready for our first rehearsal, I was over in the corner playing a Lester Young solo on my saxophone. Two of the guys walked over and joined in with me. One was Eddie Burt, a trombone player, and the other was Lauren Schoenberg. And at first I was a little nervous, like, oh my gosh, man, these guys, they know so much. If I mess this up, they're really going to know I'm messed up. But then I, I got chilled and we all, the three of us had a good time. And, you know, I'm thinking, man, these guys are in there. One of them was in his forties at the time. The other guy was in his seventies and I was 23, but we were all connected just like that, just like that. And these guys like right away, they had my back right away. You know, as I, as I recount that, I realized what a heavy thing that was for me. Um, so I, I really realized that, you know, it's not just it's not just me. Everybody learns this way. And if you don't learn this way, you're not going to learn. I'm sorry, but, but all the books, you could have every jazz book in the world, and you're not going to learn if you don't really listen. Now, you can, there's some great jazz books I'd like to recommend. David Baker has um, How to Play Bebop, Volume 1, 2, and 3, and that's uh, published by Jamie Abersalt. These books are like $10 each. They're really cheap. And they're great. But again, those books are secondary to listening. Um, what I'm going to share with you uh, now in the, um, in the chat is some of my improvisation documents. And what's really important about one of them is it has a collection of 200 of the most important small group jazz albums from about 1925 to 1970. My friend Dan Miller com, um, compiled it and he, he said, yeah, I can use it because we basically felt the same albums were important. But what I would suggest is, if you're really interested, is go through this list and uh, see which, uh, you know, listen to these recordings, check them out. And then if you like them, start to take stuff from them. Let me, let me put that up now. Here it is. 200 essential small group recordings of 1925 to 1975. So when I was a kid, if I wanted to listen to these records, I would have to go to the library and listen to them if I was lucky enough. Now, you guys on your cell phones or iPads or computers, you could listen to every one of these recordings right now if you wanted to. There's Louis Armstrong, Big Spiderbeck, Art Tatum, Jelly Roll Morton, Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, Benny Goodman. This list goes on all the way up through the bebop era. There's Fats Navarro, Clifford Brown, Bill Evans, Kenny Dorham, Charles Mingus. This is a great list. Yep, all the way up through Oscar Pettiford. So I would encourage you all to check this list out. And um, listen to those recordings. The thing that's going to happen is if you're here, you're checking this out after we've recorded it and it's uploaded to the, um, the uh, Clearwater Jazz Holiday website. You love jazz. You don't need to be prodded to listen. Uh, so you listen and you start to pick apart solos. And also, sometimes you don't want to learn a whole solo. That's okay. You might like just like one lick or three or four licks. You can learn those. Those are okay. But that's a great great way to get started. Now, the other documents I uploaded here, the Foundations for the Improvising Musician. Let me pull that one up. Let's see if I still have that up here. Oh, let me pull it up again. Give me just a second, please. Take 
me a second. Uh, here we go. There we go. Now I can share it. second I could have sworn that is there I see it there you go foundations for the improvising musician what I talk about in this document first and foremost is the feel of the eighth note the eighth note is the basic rhythm we use in jazz um, Lee Conus was a great saxophone player he used to play with Miles Davis and we were standing in line at the airport waiting to get on a plane and um, someone said to Lee, what do you do for a living? They saw him with his saxophone case. And he turned to them, kind of a, he was kind of a wiseacre. He says, uh, I pretty much play eighth notes for a living. And what that, what that meant is he's using, in, in music, we have eighth notes. Like they're here, you know, an example too, I have this bebop major scale. <laughs> Well, he was talking about that that's what he basically plays, is eighth notes. Well, the first thing that's really important with jazz music is the feel. The first way I had this written up here is that like a classical musician would play it. Let me count that off. One, two, three. Well, a jazz musician would play it the way I have written an example, too. One, two, three. Well, what I'm doing is I'm transferring the emphasis. Here, the emphasis is on our strong beats, beat one, two, three, and four. Here, the emphasis is on the upbeats, the end of one, the end of two, the end of three, and the end of four. And um, Gunther Schuller put it best. He said there's eight eighth notes in four four time, and jazz music is a democracy of those eight eighth notes. The harmony happens on beat one, two, three, and four, but the rhythm in jazz happens on the upbeats of one, two, three, and four. So the first and foremost thing of any scales that you practice or anything is in the jazz style, you're going to practice them with an emphasis on those upbeats. Let me show you. One, two, three. <laughs> That's playing the bebop major scale with the accent of the upbeats. Let me contrast that with if, if I was going to play it more of a classical style. Two, three. Versus one, two, three. The only difference really is that in the jazz way, I'm emphasizing the upbeat, not the downbeat. Duke Gellington always said it's too aggressive to emphasize the downbeat, emphasize the upbeat. <laughs> he was really hip. He could say stuff that was so cool and still be conveying a message. Now, if you notice, if you play music, I'm playing this bebop major scale. You wonder, what the heck is that? Well, one of the big lies in music is that we need to learn our scales, like major scales, and that's how you improvise. There's no truth to that at all. You don't improvise with the major scale. You add half steps to a major scale. You might add intervals to a major scale. I don't think of a lot of solos that I know that someone just uses a major scale. And this is what we call a bebop major scale. An E flat major scale is descending, is E flat, D, C, B flat, A flat, G, F, E flat. If you look at example two, I have a B natural on the end of two. That's an extra note. Well, the reason that extra note is there is it keeps our, down, our chord tones of E flat major happening on the downbeat. E flat happens on one, C happens on two, B flat happens on three, and the G uh, happens on beat four. So that's the third, fifth, sixth, and root that happen on the downbeats. Well, if you play those on the piano at the same time, it'll sound like an E flat major chord. So Bach knew this. This is the, the center of counterpoint, um, that downbeats, our ear hears downbeats naturally. If we have chord tones on downbeats, we're going to actually convey the sound of the harmony through a melody that we make up. So that is the basis for this whole document of these bebop scales and why they work. So I have a bebop major scale up here. Sounds like this. Well, I can play that from the third. 
Fifth. Six. And that's very, very hip. Watch, if I just play a major scale, one, two, with no half step. One, two, three. It doesn't sound the same way. Listen to this. Here's the bebop version of that. To me, that sounds more complete. Okay, you can check that out and, and check it out on your own to see what you think. Um, if you'd like to read more about these bebop scales, as I mentioned, that David Baker, um, three volume set, How to Play Bebop is really good. Also, one of the greatest jazz teachers ever, his name is Barry Harris. And if you Google or go to YouTube and check out Barry Harris, Barry's talking about these bebop scales online. They're very important. What they are, there's a bebop scale for a major chord. There's a bebop scale for a dominant chord. There's a bebop scale for a minor chord. I have them all included in this document, okay? Every single one. There's a dominant chord. So a B-flat dominant scale or a mixolydian scale would not have this A natural that's happening on the end of one here. It would simply be... Um, a flat, B flat, A flat, G, F, E flat, D, C, B flat. Like this, two, three. Well, those are what we're taught in, in music theory. Well, that's the Mixolydian scale. Yeah, but it, it, again, we have to add notes to that to really make that work in a harmony. And so the bebop version of the Mixolydian scale adds a half step between the root and the seventh. So between that B flat and the A flat, we're putting an A natural. Just listen to the sound, two, three. Sounds a lot better than just the regular Mixolydian scale. Check it out. Here's the Mixolydian scale. Versus. Okay, so these scales, and adding these half steps are very important. This is a deep thought, but um, and it's not my original thought. But um, we have to remember that everybody, when they're learning to improvise, gets so hung up with learning chords. People even talk about it. They say, I need to learn how to make the changes. What that means is I need to learn how to create melodies over chord changes. The big fallacy in that is to think that the chord changes are that important. The melodies you create are more important. Before um, the earliest music we know of, scales came before chords. So scales don't come from chords. Chords come from scales. So when we play certain scales, like these bebop scales, by the way, they're not really exclusive to jazz because the bebop major scale exists in the Mozart uh, flute concerto in D. I mean, right off the bat, it's the first lick, and it's a bebop major scale. Well, that was Mozart. So these scales are very important, okay? Again, um, I would suggest learning these scales in tandem with learning some of the great solos that we've talked about today. Listening listening, listening. And then in this document, I have arpeggios as well. Um, how to arpeggiate these chords. Um, there's arpeggiating major chords, um, adding a blues scale on top of things, and even how to play on the standard. I have September in the Rain here. So, um, and then I have working out on Barry Harris's system, that traditional bebop scale, and how to run it from every note in the scale. So there's a lot of um, nuts and bolts in this document, foundations for the improvising musician. But the reality is, I got to tell you, as much as I'd like to think my document is that important, it really isn't. What's really important is that you listen to the music and develop an appreciation and acute sensitivity to what the music is about through listening to the music. Um, I'm sure I don't have to plead for those of you who love jazz to do that, that you're already doing this. But I want to encourage you and get, point you in the right direction. So I've included those six solos that I think are really valuable um, to check out and try and learn some of them. This is all near and dear to my heart. And I'm 55. I'll be 56, actually, next week. And I'm still doing this today, every day, learning how to play. Um, 
you know, I'm not transcribing solos as much as I used to, but I'm still taking ideas. And I don't borrow them. I steal them. Picasso, Picasso, I, I steal his line. Picasso says, mediocre artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> I'm stealing, baby. You know, I, I'm, um, I've got a book of, I've got a book of licks that I use and, uh, you know, I, I, um, I write stuff down. Let me see I wonder if I have it here. Hang on. I keep it in my briefcase. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. Check this out. This is my little black book. Um, the very first page. Here's a lick I stole from George Garzon on his recording of Nature Boy. I wrote it down. Now, let me show you a fun one. This is, I'll show you the way I do it. Here, let me find one. Can you see what I mean? That I'm, I'm not only, I'm not just saying something to, um, to, um, make you, you know, give you busy work. So here's a, 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 a Here's a George, here's just a couple bars from a George Coleman solo on a song called Cut Plug. You can find it on YouTube if you want. It's a nice blues with Chet Baker. Now there's the original lick. Now watch this on page. This is my little notebook. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. So that was his original idea, right? Look here. It says. I think you can read it, reinvention of the George Coleman lick. So what I did was I changed some notes around and made it my own. I'm trying to, so that's, so this is how we learn how to improvise. Man, and I thought it was just me, my friend Eric Alexander, we talked, that's exactly how he does it too. You know, I'll take it, someone's idea and then morph it into my own idea. It's called standing on the shoulders of greatness. And once I changed George Coleman's lick a couple notes here, or there, it's my lick now. No one says, oh, you're stealing the George Coleman lick. Now, and I learned this from studying counterpoint. You could do it backwards. That's, that's called um, retrograde, retrograde. That Bach used to do that. And then you could flip an idea upside down. That's called inversion. So I might take an idea and flip it upside down. I might take an idea, flip it upside down, and run it backwards. That's called retrograde inversion. That's a classical composition technique. By the way, jazz musicians get a lot of their harmony from classical music. It's no, nothing new. You know, um, Big Spiderbeck was into uh, Ravel and Debussy. Uh, Charlie Parker loves Stravinsky. His favorite piece was The Rite of Spring. Um, now, it doesn't mean to say that, that jazz doesn't contribute a lot of harmony, too, but musicians are smart. You know, good musicians, they're going to take from anybody. They don't care what style of music they play or they don't care anything about them. If it's good music, they're going to take it, okay? So anyway, this is, how, uh, this is how we learn. Stand on the shoulders of greatness. So check out some of those recordings. Start working on your bebop scales. Um, if you need help with that, you can always email me, jeffrupert at ucf.edu. And Steve Weinberger, I have all these resources and I think he's gonna put them up on your website, but this is always a pleasure. This, all, this music is near and dear to my heart. It embodies the American spirit and anybody from anywhere in the world can play jazz, but this is our music. So I appreciate the Clearwater Jazz Holiday very much. Thank you very much folks for having me. It's always a pleasure, and I hope we do this again sometime. And until then, um, I want to wish you all a good afternoon and uh, keep on listening and learning. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings that a friend of mine always says is, be yourself and show your style. Another beautiful that's what, that's what yeah. it's about. That's beautiful, Jeff. Another wonderful session. Thank you so much for being part of these. It's just, it's just always so great to just kind of pause and – think about everything that we're doing and think about this great music and um, you're so passionate and dedicated to it and it's just amazing to have you on board with us so thank you for all that you're doing um, and investing your time and talents in this program 
And uh, for everybody out there that um, enjoying these and and continue watching, um, thank you too for your support. Thanks for all the sponsors that have continued to uh, contribute and expand the reach of what we're doing. Um, specifically, I'd like to shout out to our friends at the, the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association and um, Blue Water Wealth Management at Steward Partners who have been sponsoring the studio resource with all these wonderful videos. Um, this video from today will be up there shortly in addition to the materials that Jeff provides me. Um, so you'll be able to access this again. And Marine Max Clearwater for sponsoring the podcast series. I think we're up to over almost 1,100 plays in a very short time on the podcast, which is super cool. And um, we've got the Stop Time series with Frank Williams as part of that now. So you have the your dose, small doses, your daily doses of jazz history. It's just, it's just great. So, Jeff, until we meet again, I hope it's more sooner than later. And uh, everybody else out there, stay safe, be well, and keep playing. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. See you.